Chapter 1. What and Who is BreadTube? The Nature of the Counter Gang. As of this writing, the current Wikipedia article on BreadTube opens by defining it this way. BreadTube or LeftTube is a term used to refer to a loose and informal group of online content creators that provide editorial opinions and educational lectures from socialist, communist, anarchist, and other left-wing perspectives. BreadTube creators generally post videos on YouTube that are discussed on other platforms, such as Reddit. BreadTube creators are known to participate in a form of algorithmic hijacking. They will choose to focus on the topics discussed by content creators with far-right politics. This enables their videos to be recommended to the same audiences consuming far-right videos, and thereby expose a wider audience to their perspective. This Wikipedia definition of BreadTube seems to almost confirm the thesis of this book. The BreadTube is an entity that is being utilized by the more powerful, liberal, globalist wing of the Western capitalist power structure to beat back the emerging right-wing opposition. It is worth examining a few of the major players in the BreadTube universe. Natalie Contrapoints Win Probably the most level-headed and articulate voice among the BreadTube community is Natalie Wynn, who uses the moniker ContraPoints. Natalie is a transgender college graduate from Arlington, Virginia. She studied at Berkeley College of Music, Georgetown University, and Northwestern University. ContraPoints has received advertising from mainstream U.S. capitalist media, with outlets like the New York Times and the New Yorker giving their stamp of approval for her supposedly anti-capitalist rhetoric. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which equates black nationalists with Nazis and has pushed the narrative that anti-war leftists are red, brown, crypto-fascists, has approvingly cited Natalie Wynn in their reports and praised her efforts. ContraPoints has produced a number of high-budget videos intended to refute right-wing ideas and urging the left to be more coherent in presenting an alternative message. While her content is certainly of a much higher quality than other bread tubers and contains a level of intellectual depth and engagement most bread tubers are incapable of, ContraPoints is not particularly loved. ContraPoints has been targeted viciously by her own bread tube community, accused of empathizing with bigots. Trying to understand right wing views and why people adopt them is deemed an unforgivable crime by those who argue that only violence and cancel culture should be the response. This is a common viewpoint among bread tube voices. ContraPoints, herself transgender, has been critical of the ideology advocated by much of the trans movement, deconstructing some of the prevailing interpretations of what transgenderism means. This has also made her the target of lengthy harassment campaigns. ContraPoints generally puts forward the view that the U.S. government has been infiltrated by a secret Nazi conspiracy, and that the role of leftists is to protect establishment by rooting out this conspiracy. Wynn urged leftists to vote for Joe Biden in a video where she compared advocating socialist revolution to suicidal ideation. Harris Bomber Guy Brewis Harris Michael Brewis, who uses the internet moniker H. Bomber Guy, much like ContraPoints, devotes much of his content to debunking the views of right-wingers, not to promoting Marxism. Brewis is based in Britain and is a member of the Labour Party and a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. His videos largely focus on debunking the claims of pickup artists, flat earth conspiracists, and those who allege that soybeans reduce testosterone. He also comments on video games, movies, and other cultural topics. One of Brewis's greatest achievements was a fundraising stream for the British transgender advocacy and charity organization known as Mermaids. On the stream, which continued for 57 hours and 48 minutes, Brewis was joined by U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Chelsea Manning, as well as a number of Hollywood actors such as Colin Mockery and Mara Wilson. Ian Vosh Kuczynski a video game playing child of wealth from Beverly Hills named Ian Kuczynski has taken on the moniker Vosh. He has been appointed by YouTube algorithms as the unofficial spokesperson for Marxist, socialist, and leftist thought. Vosh's father is Mark Kuczynski, a figure in Hollywood who describes himself on LinkedIn as director, visual effects artist, 
and supervisor with 20 years of experience in production. In earlier years, Vosh used the moniker Irish Laddie. He appeared on the streams of internet video game enthusiast Stephen Destiny Bono to argue in favor of his interpretation of anarcho-communism. He eventually set up his own Twitch and YouTube channel on which to play video games and urge listeners to vote for Joe Biden. On his streams, Ian often claims there is a secret Nazi conspiracy that has infiltrated the U.S. government, misinterprets key Marxist concepts, equates critics of U.S. foreign policy, i.e. tankies, with Nazis, all while using excessive profanity. In the aftermath of the January 6th Capitol riot, Vosch appeared to call for a mass totalitarian style disappearing of Trump supporters, tweeting out, quote, Democracies cannot coexist with these people. They disappear, or we all do. Kaczynski seems to have an odd fascination with pedophilia. In one debate, he argued that purchasing a laptop computer was morally equivalent to purchasing child pornography. In other instances, he has argued for ending age of consent laws, though he has since claimed to have changed his position. The website Drama Report published an article on September 8, 2020, featuring claims from a former friend of Vosh who said he had admitted to her that he viewed child pornography and that she had reported him to the FBI. Ian Kaczynski has admitted that he did indeed sexually harass at least one woman while he operated under the moniker Irish Laddie, sending them inappropriate messages, including statements about and photos of his genitals, and threatening to dox the woman if she went public about his behavior. Vosch has acknowledged and apologized for such actions. A large number of unconfirmed rumors about other sexual misconduct allegedly perpetrated by Vosch can be found online. The personality of the 25-year-old indicates signs of narcissism and sex addiction. Some have speculated that his blatant rudeness and inability to comprehend other people's views indicates he may be on the autistic spectrum. Vosch seems to have a bigoted view of Midwestern and Southern Americans, viewing them as inferior rabble, not as sophisticated as he and his wealthy neighbors in Beverly Hills. In his perspective, the calls for economic justice from working people in the Rust Belt are class reductionism and fascist populism. Kaczynski has lied excessively about this author, claiming he is a literal Nazi and that he supports U.S. billionaire capitalists like Jeff Bezos, statements he clearly knows to be false. He also baited this author for allegedly being anti-American, which is a very odd accusation for a supposed Marxist and anarcho-communist to make. In many streams, it seems apparent that Vosch has handlers or advisors who are more familiar with Marxism than he is. Often Vosh will be seen stuttering his way through explaining concepts that he does not clearly understand, clearly quoting someone else, most likely an individual who learned the concept in an academic, not activist setting. In one embarrassing stream, Vosh read aloud quotes from Mao Zedong, Lenin, and Marx, which he said justified support for the Democratic Party of the United States in the 2020 election. It became clear to many viewers that the list of quotes had been prepared by someone else and that Vosh knows very little about Russian or Chinese history. However, this has not stopped the smug video game player from occupying the position of being the primary Marxist voice on the internet. Vosh routinely quotes from Radio Free Asia and other U.S. State Department propaganda outlets, treating them as reliable sources of information while deeming all media from anti-imperialist countries or putting forward an anti-imperialist perspective to be non-credible. One of Vosh's favorite talking points is to accuse all who question U.S. media allegations against China, Iran, Russia, and other anti-imperialist states of being the equivalent of Nazi Holocaust deniers. According to Vosh, if U.S. media says that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction or that the evil Spaniards have sunk the USS Maine, you must believe it. If you do not, you are the same as a neo-Nazi and deserve to be beaten up by Antifa, if not disappeared, in order to protect the great American democracy. Socialism Done Left an individual using the name Socialism Then Left on Twitter and YouTube grabs some widespread attention 
when it was revealed that they may not actually be a leftist at all. According to an article published by Vice News on April 27, 2021, quote, Socialism Done Left is a socialist YouTuber in the broad, loosely categorized group of YouTubers that's been dubbed BreadTube by fans. While Socialism Done Left nominally pushes for progressive policies, the leaked Discord messages, which include dozens of overly racist comments about Black people, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and Islamophobia, show that the public personas of some BreadTubers are at odds with what they say behind the scenes. It also has raised questions about whose side some of these streamers and YouTube personalities are really on. The messages, some of which Socialism Done Left has admitted to posting, apparently come from the YouTuber Destiny's Discord channel and were largely made in 2019. While Socialism Done Left is a much less well-known BreadTube personality, the revelations about them grabbed attention due to widespread suspicions about various BreadTube voices, their origins, and their sincerity. The Vice write-up goes on, quote, Socialism Then Left has since apologized for these messages on a Twitch livestream, saying that some of these statements were jokes made for shock humor and that he does not use this language anymore three years later in 2021. He also said that in some cases, he was mimicking the language of racists and emphasized that he doesn't find this language acceptable. Despite Socialism Then Left's apology, Leftists on Twitter and elsewhere don't seem to be buying it, or at least they don't feel obligated to trust or listen to this person any longer. End quote. The claim that such statements were intended as jokes doesn't seem to hold up when examining their context. The Vice report quotes one of the whistleblowers who said, quote, Why the fuck are black people, Jewish people, and trans people always at the butt of these shitty jokes? Who were you parroting here? Punchline? End quote. It is worth noting that Socialism Then Left echoed the anti-tanky narrative, equating leftists who do not echo U.S. foreign policy rhetoric with the far right. It seems that inciting leftists against China was a primary focus of Socialism Then Left content, much of which has been removed in the aftermath of the leaked messages. Matt Thoughtslime A Canadian comedian whose legal first name is Matt is one of the primary voices on the internet purporting to be an expert on Marxism and anarchism. Matt identifies as non-binary, meaning they do not identify with either the male or female gender and prefers to be referred to as they rather than he or she. Matt uses the YouTube moniker Thought Slime and their video background features their green snot-looking sludge. Matt is essentially a cyberbully who wraps their comedy in pseudo-leftist ideology and 90s scoff-style edge lordism. Matt seems to have had a very difficult life, something they frequently remind viewers of. Topics like suicide, depression, child abuse, bullying, and mental health are frequently discussed. After a failed comedy career, Matt turned to making movie reviews for YouTube and somehow seems to have stumbled into politics. According to YouTube Weekly Fandom, Matt's mother is Colleen Esteves, a convicted white-collar criminal. According to a CBC report dated September 26, 2013, quote, Esteves worked with Human Resources and Skills Development Canada, as well as Service Canada, and deposited unauthorized funds into a joint account she held with her partner. The court was told during an earlier appearance that approximately $75,000 was deposited between January 2007 and August 2010. The court also heard that Stevis's partner had a gambling problem and that he would inform authorities if she stopped taking money. He eventually did when the relationship ended, end quote. The report states that Colleen and Stevis, quote, pleaded guilty to fraud and breach of trust by a public official, end quote. No record exists of Matt ever being involved with any anarchist or communist organization or any activism aside from their online comedy screeds. Matt's followers tend to target whoever Matt has chosen to unleash their rage on with absurd personal attacks and harassment. Matt routinely takes the statements that people make out of context distorts opponents' positions, and makes statements that they most likely realize to be false. For example, 
Matt has claimed that this writer's father was a Wall Street banker and that this writer has never criticized the right-wing YouTube channel PragerU, among other statements that are obviously inaccurate and could be debunked by a simple Google search. Matt's videos tend to fixate on things like slime, feces, genitalia, and other things deemed to be ugly. Matt's channel is much like the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why, in that, while it appears sympathetic to the mentally ill, it more or less encourages and enables people to fixate on their depressed, rageful, and suicidal feelings, wallowing in self-pity, anger, and hopelessness. This begs a fair question. How many of Matt's mostly teenage and largely transgender audience have actually committed suicide after stewing with Matt for hours on their dark feelings? The answer is, of course, unknown. Matt is kind enough to often provide a trigger warning in front of their more depressed or grotesque screeds. Stephen Destiny Bonnell In addition to these prominent voices among the BreadTube universe, there are a couple of other individuals who are worth mentioning. While they are not all technically breadtubers by definition, they are part of the sphere from which this crop of bizarre pseudo-leftists influencers have originated. In 2011, a compulsive video game player from Nebraska quit his job as a carpet cleaner because he had figured out a method of making money entirely from playing the video game StarCraft II. Steven Dustiny Bonnell had been live-streaming his playing of the game online, and made enough money from the advertising revenue that he was able to make a very sizable income and stop working elsewhere. This achievement made him quite famous among the internet video game community. For many gamers, being able to quit their jobs, give up going outdoors or making real social connections, and live entirely by gaming seems like a dream come true. Already in Japan, there has been widespread discussion of hikikomori, acute social withdrawal where technology enables young men to live as modern-day hermits. Destiny is very much a celebrated hero among those attracted to such a lifestyle. Destiny was known to make political comments during his video game live-streaming sessions. He generally classified himself as libertarian. However, in the aftermath of Donald Trump's election in 2016, Destiny shifted toward advocating more social democratic policies. He began having debates with white nationalists, conspiracy theorists, and others deemed to be the more dangerous segment of Trump's political base. Destiny's sudden shift away from video games, and cynicism with libertarian individualism mixed in, toward the vague liberalism of the anti-Trump movement, was widely heralded in mainstream U.S. media. An article from Wired, published January 15, 2020, was entitled, quote, can this notorious troll turn people away from extremism? End quote. Destiny is not technically considered to be part of the BreadTube community. While he supported Joe Biden and advocated some left-wing policies like national health care, he explicitly rejects any form of communism, anarchism, or Marxism. Destiny is also known for having occasional right-wing turns. During the upsurge of Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, Destiny spoke with approval of right-wing activists and white supremacists who shot and killed protesters. Amid a rant condemning the property destruction of Black Lives Matter activists, he proclaimed, quote, If that means, like, white, redneck, militia dudes out there mowing down protesters who they can torch buildings at 10 p.m., then at this point, they have my blessing, end quote. The BreadTube community was quick to denounce him for such comments and he suffered a significant financial loss as many former patrons were horrified. It is a bit of an embarrassment for the BreadTube community that he has functioned as their kingmaker. Ian Vosh Kaczynski, for example, launched his career by being a frequent guest on Destiny's live streams. Most of BreadTube's big names can be traced back to some connection with Bonnell. It should be noted that the author of this book's entire introduction to the BreadTube universe came from an invitation to debate Stephen Destiny Bonnell. Bonnell was entirely blown away by this writer's citing of actual data in defense of the existing socialist countries, and the debate resulted in a huge expansion of his social media following. Bonnell approached the debate in a very smug manner, assuming that nowhere had socialist central planning ever had economic successes. Amid the debate, at one point, Stephen sputtered out the phrase, quote, What does life expectancy prove? 
end quote, revealing a darker, Malthusian undertone in his worldview. Caleb Faraday Speaks, Kane. Caleb Kane was made temporarily famous by a New York Times article published on June 8, 2019. The article is featured on the New York Times website with an intricate graphic and text that sound almost like a movie trailer. Quote, Caleb Kane was a college dropout looking for direction. He turned to YouTube. Soon he was pulled into a far-right universe, watching thousands of videos filled with conspiracy theories, misogyny, and racism. I was brainwashed. End quote. The article seems, on its surface, to be a telling story of how an impressionable young man can be seduced by extremism and become a violent radical. The article opens with an account of him buying his first firearm. However, the actual details of Kane's story are quite disappointing. Caleb Kane was a young man in West Virginia who had grown up in a conservative Christian family but became more liberal as he matured. According to his own account, he dropped out of college following some psychological problems and began supporting himself by working at a warehouse. While working at the warehouse, he had lots of time to listen to YouTube videos and soon became a regular listener to Stefan Molyneux. Stefan is the anarcho-capitalist internet guru who's known to flirt with misogynist and racist ideas amid his overall libertarian perspective. After listening to Molyneux regularly, he also consumed content from other racist and far-right commentators. King's story might be more compelling if from there he had become a terrorist or committed hate crimes, but it stops there. The New York Times narration has one expecting that Kane became a suicide bomber or mass shooter, or joined armed attempts to overthrow the government. However, he did none of this. The extent of Kane's brainwashing was listening regularly to right-wing voices online. Kane eventually shifted his political views. A new girlfriend who had a more compassionate worldview and his changing life circumstances enabled him to de-radicalize and unbrainwash himself. Yet, in Kane's interviews, he speaks as if he is repenting from the heaviest of sins. In one interview, he says with deep regret that at one point he considered going to the Charlottesville protests in 2017, but decided not to. After the advertising of the New York Times article, Kane launched his own YouTube channel, Faraday Speaks, celebrating his status as a former extremist who had been de-radicalized. However, the extent of Kane's radicalism was nothing more than listening to YouTube videos, becoming more distant with his family, and at one point considering going to a demonstration, but deciding not to. King has collaborated with Destiny in efforts to combat the extremism that sucked him in. He has done interviews about how to deprogram one's friends and relatives. But what exactly are they being deprogrammed from? Listening to videos online? Having political views that change with a new romantic relationship? Considering maybe going to a demonstration? Caleb King has made clear in interviews that he advocates for social media to censor and remove ideas he considers to be conspiracy theories in order to prevent others from being brainwashed as he was. Caleb King's emergence as a minor figure in the BreadTube universe, initiated and promoted by mainstream media voices, much like Destiny and ContraPoints, is almost comical. The nature of BreadTube is a poorly executed de-radicalization effort by the most powerful factions among the imperialists, is made quite apparent. Dr. Steve Hassan One figure who is definitely not part of the BreadTube universe, but certainly lurks in the background of discussions about deprogramming, is psychologist Dr. Steve Hassan. Over the course of many decades, Hassan has carved out for himself the position as America's leading cult expert. His books on what he calls cult mind control, are widely circulated, and he appears on CNN, MSNBC, and other TV outlets as an expert on the topic of brainwashing. As a 19-year-old, Steve Hassan was recruited into the Unification Church, Moonies. This is an anti-communist religious cult imported to the United States by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency to work against the growth of the communist organizations on college campuses. 
In the 1970s, many young people were involved in protesting the Vietnam War and in support of black liberation. College campuses were a hotbed of recruitment for the Revolutionary Union, now the Revolutionary Communist Party, Youth Against War and Fascism, Youth Wing of Workers' World Party, the Young Workers' Liberation League, now the Young Communist League, Youth Wing of the Communist Party USA, and other anti-imperialist and revolutionary organizations. Image Description The rise of religious cults such as the Unification Church during the 1970s was intentionally fomented by U.S. intelligence to counter the influence of Marxist-Leninist groups on college campuses. The Unification Church, a strange religious sect that worshipped a Korean pastor named Sang Myung Moon, had begun rapidly expanding in the United States during the 1970s. The group believed Moon was the new messiah, sent to earth to unify the Christians of the world in a global crusade against communism. Moon's cult had started in coordination with Korean intelligence as a way of deprogramming Marxist political prisoners and student activists. The Moonies became infamous for their predatory nature. They financially exploited members, demanding they hand over all their possessions, and spend each waking hour as unpaid laborers raising funds for the group. Steve Hassan admits that the cult he spent roughly two years as an active member of was set up by American intelligence. In his appearance on the podcast of Jordan Harbinger, he said, quote, Post-World War II, Korean War, South Korea was very unstable. North Korea is a version of what it is today. And some people in military intelligence in the United States decided, well, the North Koreans are brainwashing. We need to create a program in South Korea to stabilize the regime. They thought the South Korean president, you need to set up a Korean CIA, we'll help you and they set up a re-education program for dissidents in South Korea, and they decided to use a front person, so he was not looking like a government operation, and it was the Moonies that were chosen to do that. The Moonies had, nobody knows why or how, the patents for manufacturing M16 rifles and other American military hardware. Why? Because America was leaving Vietnam. Still the height of the Cold War, we have to stop the commies. And then somebody said, Let's bring the Moonies to the United States and set up counter-communist programs on college campuses. And that's where I got recruited. I was sent to fast for Nixon during Watergate because God loves Nixon, God wants Nixon. The U.S. government has never acknowledged the existence of these things. They don't want to talk about it. End quote. As a young man rising up the ranks of the Moonies, Hassan eventually got into a car accident. And in the hospital, his parents were able to lure him away from the group to their home where he was successfully deprogrammed by other former members. Eventually, Hassan got involved with the Cult Awareness Network, an organization run by Ted Patrick. Hassan worked with Patrick's organization, which charged lots of money to families for the service of kidnapping relatives believed to be in Moonies or other groups labeled as cults. Affiliates of the Cult Awareness Network are widely accused of having held these young legal adults against their will and deprogrammed them. Individuals who were deprogrammed by Patrick and his associates testified that the deprogramming sessions involved brutal interrogations, sleep deprivation, and the very techniques the cults were accused of using. Hassan has admitted that he was involved in involuntary deprogrammings, but has not gone into detail about this. Ted Patrick was convicted of kidnapping and false imprisonment in 1980 after he and other members of the Cult Awareness Network, the organization with which Steve Hassan was affiliated, kidnapped a 26-year-old waitress in Tucson, Arizona. Kidnapping and false imprisonment are both very serious crimes, but Patrick only received a year in prison and a $5,000 fine. Patrick also faced charges in later years after he kidnapped an Amish woman whose husband disapproved of her joining a more liberal sect. These charges were ultimately dropped. Image Description U.S. media often highlights Steve Hassan as a cult expert, but rarely mentions his ties to the Cult Awareness Network and accusations that he engaged in involuntary deprogramming, i.e. kidnapping. The Cult Awareness Network was eventually shut down in 1995 after a jury ruled that Jason Scott had his civil liberties and religious freedom violated 
when CAN affiliate Rick Ross kidnapped him and attempted to deprogram him. CAN was ordered to pay $1 million to Scott and ultimately went bankrupt. Accounts from various individuals describe Hassan as being directly involved in the kidnappings. An individual named Arthur Rosell put forward a sign of fida vi describing Hassan's methods. Rosell said that he was, quote, forcibly kidnapped by several men, imprisoned, hands and feet bound, with his hands tied behind his back so tightly they were badly swollen and the color of a bruise, end quote. Deprived of sleep for three days, he was not allowed to shave or wash and was denied all privacy, even when using the toilet. Hassan subjected him to methods the victim later described as brainwashing and mind control techniques. Hassan even threatened him with drugs if he did not recant his religious beliefs. End quote. Rizal described the experience, saying he felt like, quote, a captured animal in a zoo. End quote. In his more recent books, Hassan has denounced kidnapping and forced deprogrammings, but he does not directly address most of the allegations about what he is alleged to have done with the Cult Awareness Network. One would think that Hassan would be discredited due to his involvement in an organization that was widely reputed to have been involved in criminal activities. Hassan has not only avoided persecution, but frequently appears on mainstream U.S. television as a cult expert. Hassan composed a book entitled The Cult of Trump in 2019, declaring that the U.S. president was much like the Reverend Sam Myung Moon and had brainwashed his supporters with hypnotic mind control methods. Hassan made headlines in January of 2021 after an appearance on CNN in the aftermath of the events on Capitol Hill. Hassan said, quote, So, in studying all the thought reform brainwashing models, I developed a B-I-T-E model of authoritarian control. And it basically talks about controlling behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions to create a new identity that's dependent and obedient. And this is a radical personality change in the mental health literature. In the APA DSM-5, it's called the Dissociative Disorder, Questioning of Identity. And the bottom line is, all of America needs deprogramming because we've all been negatively influenced by Donald Trump. End quote. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez echoed his calls for deprogramming. Hassan has been a mentor to Caleb Kane, and according to an unnamed source, appears to be advising other members of the BreadTube community in their efforts to de-radicalize Americans on the far right. Hassan describes Donald Trump as the leader of a cult, and also refers to the internet conspiracy theory QAnon as a cult, despite the fact that they do not fit his own criteria for what a cult is. Hassan's B-I-T-E model of authoritarian control simply does not hold up. The behavior of QAnon adherents and Trump supporters is not restricted, and they are not told what information they can consume online or in the media. Trump supporters do not change their names or undergo hypnosis. The emotions of Trump supporters in QAnon are not subject to regulation. As bad as he is, Donald Trump is merely a demagogic politician with many fanatical supporters. As inaccurate and delusional as it is, QAnon is an internet conspiracy theory with all kinds of different interpretations among adherents. The political movement behind Donald Trump, or the internet conspiracy theories known as QAnon, have very little in common with the Unification Church. However, while media overlooks his own shady past, Steve Hassan has been given a platform to declare Trump and QAnon to be a cult and has suggested that mass deprogramming might need to take place. Some other aspects of Steve Hassan are worth noting. While Hassan occasionally will admit that the Unification Church which he joined and feels horrifically victimized by was facilitated by the U.S. government, he seems to hold no resentment against the CIA or the U.S. government. In fact, in his anti-cult lectures, he often makes statements like, quote, China is the biggest political cult in the world, end quote. He seems to have a particular vendetta against the Russian government, claiming that Russian President Vladimir Putin leads a political cult. Hassan attributes much of his success to Robert J. Lifton, 
a U.S. Air Force psychiatrist who conducted research in Japan and Korea on U.S. soldiers who had been converted to communism in POW camps. Hassan admits that much of his understanding of brainwashing and cult mind control comes directly from Lifton, an individual who is very widely known to be involved with U.S. military intelligence and its psychological operations against communism. Hassan's avoidance of prosecution for kidnapping, his celebration in mainstream media, his working of U.S. foreign policy talking points into his co-lecturers, his hinting at inside knowledge about the Unification Church's intelligence connections, and his close association with a high-ranking U.S. military psychiatrist all indicate that Hassan is much more than a typical psychologist or anti cold lecturer. Hassan appears to have friends on the inside who enable him to do what he does and see him as useful in carrying out their political goals. The same can be said for BreadTube, which appears to be some kind of cyber HD programming operation aimed at the U.S. right wing, but also targeting legitimate Marxist-Leninists and anti-imperialists. Counter Gangs and the Late Cold War Understanding BreadTube's emergence as a brand of establishment-approved socialism while observing the lingering influence of a deprogrammer named Steve Hassan forces us to discuss the 20th century Cold War and how the Soviet Union and its allies were defeated. Below is an overview of the facts about how American intelligence was able to maneuver events toward the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union. This will lay out the historical precedent for an entity like BreadTube and the purpose it serves, both domestically and internationally. The Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union began in 1946 after the Second World War and ended in 1991, when the Soviet Union was dissolved. The Cold War can be divided into two distinct periods. The first period of the Cold War, beginning in the mid-40s and ending in the late 60s, involved American intelligence agencies and geopolitical strategists operating under the assumption that the enemy was communism. The Truman Doctrine of Containment involved the United States building the NATO alliance and seeking to unify the world against China, the Soviet Union, and other countries in which Marxist-Leninist parties had taken over. This period involved two massive U.S. military interventions, one on the Korean Peninsula and the other one in Vietnam. Both of these operations came at heavy cost to the United States in terms of human life, domestic morale, and international credibility. During the Korean War, the world was shaken by the use of massive bombing of civilian targets by the U.S. military. European allies and other international observers looked on in horror as U.S. Army General Douglas MacArthur threatened to drop atomic bombs on China without even the permission of the elected U.S. president. Domestic opposition to the Korean War was limited due to the McCarthyism and post-World War II patriotism at home. However, among the soldiers on the battlefield, it was a different story. Image Description At first, only communists like the W.E.B. Du Bois clubs and Youth Against War and Fascism protested the Vietnam War. However, by 1968, mass anti-war sentiments and a domestic political crisis had unfolded. Many American soldiers were disgusted by their orders to bomb civilians. Roughly 4,000 captured U.S. soldiers signed confessions to war crimes and declared themselves to be communist sympathizers in POW camps. This launched a wave of fascination with brainwashing in American media and among American intelligence researchers. At the worst conclusion, Korea remained divided and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which the USA had sought to eliminate, remained intact with a highly loyal population. The setbacks experienced by the United States during the Korean War came back with an even greater vengeance during the Vietnam War. Protesters against the war took place all across the world with the Vietnamese people celebrated as peasant anti-imperialist heroes resisting the foreign occupiers. At home, protests against the war, combined with the rising unrest of the African-American community, resulted in the widespread episode of domestic unrest. In 1968, 
almost every major U.S. city went up in flames following the murder of Dr. Martha Luther King Jr., and campus anti-war protests became very popular. The communist factions of Students for a Democratic Society and the Black Panther Party emerged as explicitly Marxist-Leninist organizations seeking to overthrow U.S. capitalism in alliance with Vietnam, China, Cuba, and the Soviet Union. Among the U.S. Army, the factions, insubordination, and fragging of officers became widespread. The United States was ultimately defeated in Vietnam, and as a result, a new strategy for dealing with the Soviet Union and international communism emerged. This brought on the second stage of the Cold War, referred to as the Late Cold War. Zbigniew Brzezinski, a Polish-American academic, joined with strategist Henry Kissinger to establish the Trilateral Commission. The Trilateral Commission was a think tank funded by the Rockefeller family to reorient U.S. foreign and domestic policy in light of the defeat of U.S. forces in Vietnam and the widespread state of upheaval in the country at the time. Image Description Zbigniew Brzezinski was key in working with the Trilateral Commission to reorient U.S. strategy in the aftermath of defeat in Vietnam. He focused on soft power and manipulating communists against each other. Brzezinski's strategy for working against the communists involved scaling back the use of massive bombing and long-term military engagements, but instead utilizing proxy forces and exploiting the divisions that already existed among communists. Frank Kitson, the British intelligence officer who oversaw operations to defeat the Kenyan Land and Freedom Army, boasted of his use of counter-gangs to defeat the Kenyan resistance to the British Empire during the 1950s. Kitson directed the British Army to form groups of black Africans and deploy them throughout Kenya. These counter-gangs pretended to be Mau Mau liberation fighters, but were actually allies of the British. These forces collected intelligence, committed atrocities that could be blamed on the Mau Mau, sowed division among the Kenyan population, and ultimately enabled the British to defeat the insurgency. Frank Kitson later went on to oversee British military operations against the Irish Republican Army. In his work, he engineered a policy of arming Protestant extremists and enabling them to kill IRA members. A 2015 lawsuit was brought by Mary Heenan. Her husband was assassinated by Ulster Defense Association members in 1973. Her lawsuit alleged that Kitson was responsible for, quote, the use of loyalist paramilitary gangs to contain the Republican nationalist threat through terror, manipulation of the rule of law, infiltration and subversion all core to the Kitson military doctrine endorsed by the British Army and the British government at the time, end quote. Brzezinski directed the United States to take a page from Kitson and begin setting up counter gangs around the world to fight Soviet-aligned communists, while the United States seemed apparently uninvolved. The first obvious use of the Kitson counter gang strategy in the aftermath of the U.S. defeat in Vietnam came in 1978 as the Kampuchea War. The Communist Party of Cambodia was overrun by a fanatical leader named Pol Pot and his followers. Pol Pot rejected industrialization and argued Cambodia could achieve full communism on the basis of the agrarian economy. Image Description In order to defeat the Mau Mau Land and Freedom Army in Kenya, the British military developed the tactic of building counter gangs. Pol Pot attacked Vietnam resulting in the Kampuchea War. China, arguing that the Vietnamese were acting as agents of Soviet social imperialism, sent its forces to invade Vietnam in support of Cambodia. It has later been revealed that Pol Pot, the crazed ultra-leftist who rejected basic principles of Marxism-Leninism and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Cambodian and Vietnamese communists, was in fact a covert puppet of the United States. Pol Pot had been educated in France, and the U.S. government was providing him with guns and weapons in his fight against the pro-Soviet communists in his homeland and against Vietnam. Pol Pot and his allies represented a counter-gang 
much like those engineered by Frank Kitson in Kenya. The use of counter gangs became a key staple of U.S. strategic policy in the late Cold War. Brzezinski bragged that he set up the Afghan trap for the Soviet Union, creating a situation in Afghanistan where the Soviet Union would feel obligated to send in their military, and then arranging for Osama bin Laden to build a global army of Wahhabi extremists from across the planet to fight them in the name of Islam. In Angola, the United States armed a group called UNITA, led by Jonas Savimbi, a literal cannibal and mass murderer who claimed to be a Maoist communist. Savimbi's forces fought against the pro-Soviet ruling party of Angola, murdering civilians as well as Cuban and Angolan soldiers in a lengthy civil war. In Ethiopia, the United States armed Eritrean separatists to fight against the pro-Soviet Derg government. In the Middle East, two anti-imperialist governments, the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Ba'af Socialist Arab Republic of Iraq, were played against each other. The U.S. government first supported Saddam Hussein in his invasion of Iran, and later the U.S. government supported Iran in its fight against Iraq. There were mass deaths on both sides, among both fighters and civilians. During this time, many pro-Marxist college professors and writers in Europe received covert support from the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. They were carefully being nudged to push a more anti-Soviet brand of Marxism, focused on cultural issues rather than class struggle. The CIA boasts about the Congress for Cultural Freedom program, in which magazines like Partisan Review, Encounter, and Der Monat were covertly funded to reorient Marxist thought amongst European intellectuals. In 1978, the Italian, French, and Spanish Communist parties cut ties with the Soviet Union, and Brzezinski labeled them Eurocommunists. Counterculture-oriented religious groups, like Reverend Moon's Unification Church, of which Steve Hassan was an ex-member, Transcendental Meditation, Tibetan Buddhism, and the Hare Krishna movement, were deemed to be very useful by American intelligence in rolling back the influence of communists among intellectuals and dissidents at home. All of this covert manipulation of armed communist groups, socialist countries, and leftist intellectuals culminated in overthrowing the Soviet Union in 1991. Many of the confused students who marched to overthrow the Marxist-Leninist governments in Eastern Europe did not think they were helping to bring in neoliberalism and the economic demolition of their homelands. They believed it was just to make a more democratic form of socialism, or socialism with a human face. Decades later, in conditions where information travels much faster in the age of the internet, BreadTube appears to be yet another counter-gang. Like the Khmer Rouge, UNITA, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, or the various counterculture religious cults, it speaks in the name of left-wing sounding ideals. In reality, it is most likely serving one section of the American ruling elite and the intelligence agencies. Covert support is most likely being provided in order to enable the algorithmic hacking that has allowed BreadTube to flourish as the primary left-wing voice online, while waging a relentless campaign against others. The important thing to remember about counter gangs in the late Cold War is that they are generally not conscious deceivers. Some will read the above contents and believe that African Maoists, UNITA, left wing intellectuals, or the Red Tubers of 2021 are all secret CIA agents or some other crude interpretation. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is no doubt that the fighters of UNITA the Wahhabis who fought alongside Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, the intellectuals who pushed Eero communism, or even the bread tubers of our time, legitimately believed in what they said and did. While they may be naive about the support they receive, what makes them useful proxies is their sincerity. Selecting certain ignorant and confused young people to be the voice of the movement, and perhaps carefully nudging them to frame the rhetoric, in a certain way, is key. By rewarding them with patrons and clicks, the narrative can be carefully reinforced. 
a new socialism that is not anti-imperialist, not even genuinely anti-capitalist, but is very useful in containing and beating back the right wing, can be cultivated to serve imperialism. Conclusion An overview of the personalities, histories, and connections of various breadtubers and affiliated personalities highlights certain similarities. None of them have any direct ties to any existing communist, anarchist, or socialist activist groups, aside from perhaps democratic socialists of America. No record of actual activism as Marxists can be found when looking over their public history. Much like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they seem to have appeared out of nowhere to suddenly become representatives of left-wing politics. While they do not have ties to Marxist-Leninist or anarchist activist groups, they do have apparent ties to the U.S. power structure. Their work is celebrated in mainstream U.S. media outlets. They are presented as a safe kind of leftism and a needed counterbalance to the rise of Donald Trump. Some of them have odd skeletons in their closets. Natalie Wynn's sudden rise to prominence, Vosh's shady history in relation to topics like child pornography and lack of charisma, the criminal conviction of Matt Thought Slime's mother and their fixation on topics like suicide and self-harm, Destiny's shift from libertarian to social democrat, followed by his celebration of right-wing attacks on protesters, mysterious social media history of socialism then left, Caleb Keane's celebrated status as an ex-right-wing extremist despite any real history of right-wing activism. All of these indicate the bread tube has powerful allies who are using them to serve a purpose other than communist revolution. Divisions within the capitalist ruling class are the natural outgrowth of an economic and social crisis such as the Western world is currently experiencing. The alt-right and white supremacist groups put forward a toxic ideology that leads to hate crimes, mass shootings, and a justification for political repression. The existence of BreadTube as an entity, pushed forward by elements within the deep state to defend the liberal order from white-wing opposition, is not really in itself a scandalous revelation. It is to be expected in times such as these. However, in addition to demonizing the Trump movement and the various online currents aligned with it, BreadTube has another target. One thing that all these figures agree on is that China and Russia, and to some extent, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, Vietnam, and Nicaragua are somehow toxic, totalitarian societies, and it is the duty of Western leftists to undermine and destabilize these countries. Vosh has been the most explicit in equating pro-Chinese communists with Nazis, while celebrating the Hong Kong protesters who unfurl Pepe the Frog signs and Trump banners, but these sentiments are more or less prevalent throughout the entire bread tube sphere. The narrative that somehow Trump supporters and QAnon are an extension of the illiberalism of the anti-imperialist bloc is also implied in much of BreadTube's material. The main problem with BreadTube is not that it dissects the ideas of the far right. This is a largely noble task, though it is sometimes very poorly executed due to the ideological limitations of those who avoid offending the liberal order. The main problem with BreadTube is that it is blatantly miseducating people and misinterpreting key concepts of Marxism, socialism, and communism. BreadTube does not seek to make those exploring these concepts in a time of economic crisis into revolutionaries and anti-imperialists. Rather, they seek to make them into something much like they are, foot soldiers of the liberal order. They embolden the most powerful capitalists in their efforts to maintain power, beat back anti-imperialist states, and suppress unrest and rebellion at home. Deconstructing the various misinterpretations and delusions presented by BreadTube in order to achieve this goal will be the purpose of the remaining pages of this book.